one, the one figure we regard as utter nonsense is the so-called EBITDA. Or, I mean, the idea of looking at a figure before the cash requirements of merely staying in the same place, and there usually are, any business with significant fixed assets you, almost always has with it a, a concomitant uh, requirement that major cash be be reinvested in order simply to stay in the same place competitively and, and in terms of unit sales. To look at some figure that is before, uh, that, that is stated before those cash requirements is, is absolute folly and it's been misused by lots of people who sell lots of merchandise in, in recent years. It's not to the credit of the investment banking fraternity that it has learned to speak in terms of EBITDA. I mean, the idea of of using a measure you, that you know is nonsense and then piling additional reasoning on that false assumption, it, it's not creditable intellectual performance. And then once everybody is talking in terms of nonsense, why well, it gets to be standard. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Andy Marino of uh, Chapel Hill uh, by way of Boston. Uh, you have argued against the use of alternate measures of profitability, such as earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, as measures of business performance. Uh, at the same time, you have frequently cited the incompleteness of generally accepted accounting in reflecting economic reality for some businesses, implying that there are some necessary and proper adjustments. Beyond what you recently described in the annual report as the folly of omitting depreciation, could you elaborate on your thoughts on other pitfalls of alternative financial presentations? Is EBITDA, in your view, just too often used as a shorthand for cash flow, or is the entire concept of recasting accounting data a suspect exercise? And uh, which revisions might be appropriate, if any, and what might be viewed as red flags, and does it matter to you who is making those adjustments, analysts, investors for their own purposes, or company managements in terms of how that information should be viewed? Yeah, we regularly told you for some years before the accounting change was made here a year or so ago, we told you you should not count goodwill amortization. You know, it, it was required under GAAP, and we obviously complied with GAAP, but we told you every year virtually that I can remember, we said this is not really an economic expense. And we ignore it in our own calculations of, of, of earnings in terms of what we will pay for businesses. We don't care whether there's a goodwill item or not because it, it, it's immaterial to economic reality. So we have been quite willing at, at Berkshire to tell our own owners to ignore certain things and if they disagreed with us, they, they could look at the gap figures, but we felt they were getting misled by, by looking at the amortization of intangibles. Um, that doesn't mean we think all intangibles were good, but we just, we did feel that that was a, that was an arbitrary and a decision that didn't make any, any, any sense at all. Um, and we've felt, obviously, as we've talked about, we've felt the crazy pension assumptions have, have, uh, uh, caused people to, uh, record phantom earnings uh, in many cases. Uh, uh, so we're, we're willing to tell you when we think there is data that is more important in economic analysis than gap figures, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you about it. Not thinking of depreciation as an expense, though, strikes us as absolutely crazy. I, I can think of very few businesses, I can think of a couple, but I can think of very few businesses where depreciation is not a real re expense. Even at our gas pipelines, I mean, you know, at some point, they are, A, a they will need, they'll need repairs, but beyond at some point, they become obsolete. I mean, they're, they're, there won't be gas there 200 years from now, we know that. So it, it, Depreciation is real, and it's the worst kind of expense. It's reverse float. You know, you lay out the money before you get revenue, and you are out cash with nothing coming in. And depreciation, any, any management that doesn't regard depreciation as expense is, you know, is living in a dream world, but of course they're encouraged to do that, you know, by investment bankers who talk to them about EBITDA, and then it, 
you know, certain people have built fortunes on misleading investors by convincing them that EBITDA was a big deal. And when we see companies that say, hey, we don't pay any taxes and, you know, because we don't have any earnings for tax purposes and don't count depreciation and all of that, you know, that's coming, in our view, many times that's coming very close to a flim-flam game. Uh, uh, you know, I get these people that show me, you know, they want to send me books with EBITDA in it, and I just tell them, you know, I'll, I'll look at that figure when you tell me you'll make all the capital expenditures. Um, but if I'm going to make the capital expenditures, there's very few businesses where I think I can spend a whole lot less than depreciation year after year and maintain the economic strength of the business. Uh, so I think, I think the EBITDA has been a term that has cost a lot of investors a lot of money. You saw it in the telecom field. I mean, the idea that they were spending money so damn fast, you know, I mean, they couldn't have it coming in the door fa fast enough from investors. And then they pretended that depreciation uh, was not a real expense. That, that's nonsense. I mean, it couldn't be worse. And, uh, and a generation of investors were sort of brought up to, to believe in that. Uh, uh, we at Berkshire will spend more than our depreciation this year. We spent more than our depreciation last year. We spent more than our depreciation the year before that. You know, depreciation is a real expense. It's just as much as, you know, the expenditure for, for lights. It, it's not a non-cash expense. It's a cash expense. You just spend it first. You know, I mean, the cash is gone. And it's, it's, it's a delayed recording of cash expense. And, how anybody can turn that into something they use as a metric that, that talks about earnings is beyond me. Charlie? Yeah, I think you would understand any presentation using the word EBITDA. If every time you saw that word, you just substituted the phrase bullshit earnings. I knew he'd do it sooner or later, folks. <laughs> and the he, man, made, he made it through the morning, but it, never all day. And the man asked the question also, he says, what remaining big accounting troubles exist? The real Lollapalooza is pension fund accounting and to some extent post-retirement medical liabilities. Those are horribly understated now in America and they're very big numbers. I've looked at financial statements and, and you've seen them too in the, in the last few months where companies are recording pension income in the hundreds of millions while at the same time being underfunded in their pension plan in the many billions. And you know, they just aren't facing up the reality at all and they don't want to because they don't want to take the hit. And they're this, you know, it's the same mentality as stock option expenses. And they are paying people with stock options, but you know, we pay people with cash bonuses. And I suppose, you know, we might, well, isn't really true, but, but we, we might like it if we didn't have to record cash bonuses as an expense. I mean, it's a way we pay people. And you can say, well, why don't you put it in the footnotes and leave it out of the income account like they do with option expenses, which is a form of compensation too. But the, you know, the, the answer is that a bunch of people who cared very much about having their stocks float to unreasonable prices, at least in our view, uh, found they could do it a lot easier if they didn't count it compensation expenses. And, you know, why not put all expenses in footnotes? Just have an item there that says sales and then have the same figure for net profit and then just have all the, <laughs> all the expenses in the footnotes, you know. The, and, and people with a straight face, you know, say, well, it's in the footnotes, so therefore everybody knows about it and we don't have to count it, put it in the income account. It's, it's amazing what people with high IQs will do to rationalize their own, you know, their own pocketbooks. Uh, and Charlie has another explanation for why there's been this denial of, of, of the reality of expense, uh, option expense in terms of people's ego getting involved with their own records. And you want to elaborate on that, Charlie? Or... <laughs> Don't <Well>. name names. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm so tiresome on this subject and I've been on it for so many decades. It's such a rotten way to run a civilization, to make the basic accounting wrong. It is very much like making the engineering wrong when you're building a bridge. And when I see reputable people making these perfectly ridiculous arguments to the effect that 
Okay. It's unthinkable that options be expense. Or it's too difficult to value. It, well, because it's too difficult to value or God knows what reason. And there, a lot of them are people you'd be glad to have marry your daughter. And yeah, because they're rich for one thing. <laughs> Yet the truth of the matter is they're somewhere between crazy and crooked. Put him down as undecided. Uh. <laughs>